Welcome, everybody, to the weekly WP Roundup with BJ Keaton. That's me. And every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern, we get together and we talk about all of the news and the tutorials and the resources that I could find this week so that we can make your next week in WordPress just a little bit better. If you've never joined us before, or maybe if you have, uh, feel free to throw in anything you have to say in the comments. We try to make this a very, very uh, interactive show where we talk to each other and uh, really get to know each other. If you have any kind of questions or problems, the community is fantastic at answering them. Uh, and if I can't answer them, hopefully somebody there can. Um, so let's get to know each other. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And, uh, you know, let's dig into the news. Uh, so the first thing that I saw this week, this was early on in the week, and I wanted to bring you a little, bring it to your attention if you haven't seen this yet, uh, that WPML uh, had a breach. Um, the uh, their, their website was hacked, and if you have used any of the WPML plugins, uh, the and former employee kind of uh, spammed everyone who was in their database. Um, right now, it's taken care of. There's nothing to really worry about. Uh, but if you've used that before, I just wanted to uh, to let everybody know to check your email, uh, change your passwords, that kind of thing. I mean, the normal stuff that you do after there's any kind of data breach. I think at this point, we're probably all used to it, uh, where when uh, something goes on like this, that we're just like, yep, Time to change the password again, and uh, you reset last pass or one password or whatever it is that you use. So um, it was it was funny that the email I don't uh, it links to the email in the website that I've put in the description of the video, uh, but it. It's funny to me that the email was fairly poorly written. Uh, there were typos and everything in it, but what it was saying was that WPML stuff was insecure. It's like, this is a backdoor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, typical stuff that you get when someone has instigated a data breach. Um, so it was something that I don't think is any problem. There hasn't been any kind of fallout from it. There, there hasn't been anything like that. But uh, like I said, it's something that I want you guys to be aware of, that if you've used use WPML at all, uh, that you should probably change your password, do things like that uh, as you go around. So hopefully none of you guys were terribly affected by that. And uh, as you move forward, just, you know, typical data security, use good passwords. Don't use the same passwords places. Use a password manager if you can. Uh, it feels a little redundant sometimes to say, take all of your passwords and put them in one place. But uh, that really is one of the best ways to keep everything together together uh, and secure is to hide everything uh, securely encrypted behind a very secure master password um, with a key and 2FA, all of this. So there are ways to, to be more secure than most of us are uh, are allowed, let ourselves be. Um, I'm a LastPass user. I see that Judy in uh, the Facebook comments uh, is as well. Although recently I have thought about switching over to 1Password and I'm curious if anybody else has uh, used the 1Password uh, security stuff because I was reading about one of these latest uh, hacks that came out. There was a uh, I want to say there was like a billion usernames dumped onto uh, the dark web and they were loaded into Have I Been Pwned. And one of the services that I found uh, through reading about this on Have I Been Pwned is a uh, pwned passwords. And you could go in and see they, they separated all the passwords from the usernames and you could type in your password and it was completely secure, separate from everything. It was just a list of the use passwords and that you could... Um, if you could type it in, you could see whether or not your password was in that database. Like that was all it was. It didn't show what it was tied to. It didn't show uh, anything else. It showed how many times that particular password showed up in the, in the uh, database that was there. And, you know, knock on wood, cross my fingers. Uh, thank my lucky stars. The main, and I'm, I'm dumb, I use some of the same passwords everywhere that, uh, or certain uh, same places that you guys do. The primary uh, rotation that I have weren't in the database. So I was like, oh, yay, everything's good. Um, but it's, uh, 
it's something that uh, one password has to let you know of password breaches that they have one to uh, to monitor password security where your if yours was, has shown up in a database like that they will let you know uh, so it's really really interesting to me that uh, one password does that I'm hoping that uh, LastPass pulls through and does stuff like that because I really like the service. Um, I see Video Superhero on Facebook. Um, on Facebook says, if the S3 plugin for images is active in a network mode, do you know what plugins or specific settings might conflict with gallery settings preview thumbnails not showing S3 paths? Um, I've had that with caching plugins, and I've had it pro had it have. Um, I've had I've had it problem my words y'all um i've had it happen whenever i was using the uh, s3 caching um for lazy loading any kind of lazy loading i had set up messed up and um i've had it where i've had to empty and reset the cache a lot um primarily for me it was uh lazy loading that i'd set and a few settings that i'd had it wasn't specifically um fixed after that i had to disable some other things on the site but uh, maybe other people had have better <laughs> better solutions than that but i had to disable lazy loading uh we got most of it fixed for me when when i had that happen um so you know y'all know that i love uh yoast and just very quickly uh it's very interesting that the creator of Yoast, the uh, whose name right now I cannot think of, uh, Juiced, uh, is no longer the CEO. He founded Yoast in 2010, and he's not there anymore. Um, he has moved into the chief product officer, uh, product... I gotta find it again because it was product something. Yeah, chief product officer of Yoast, and uh, that means he's gonna be more hands-on in development, um, the way they said he will... Uh, look into uh, different tools and things like that. So we, they have a new SE, uh, CEO, a <laughs> new SEO at Yoast, a new CEO at Yoast. And um, I, I'm not familiar with her. Um, apparently she's been acting as the CEO for a while now. Um, and she's just now uh, officially given that title. So um, it's, uh, oh my I have something stuck to my face, and it feels like. Um, but she is uh, has been on the board since 2014. Uh, if she's been running the company uh, basically as CEO, everything is great. She is uh, doing a great job. Their plugin has has done nothing but get better over the over like the past year. It's it's blossomed in my mind. So so that's cool. They have a new CEO. Uh, the founders moved into a different thing. So I'm, I'm excited to see what kind of new stuff they come up with. And really more than that, I'm excited to see what the competitors do to keep up because Yoast is the default SEO that most people go for. Um, and all-in-one SEO and others are great options. Uh, I found one called Squirrely recently that uh, I actually really liked. Um, it was it had some issues with Gutenberg editing, so I ended up having to uninstall it, but I really, um, really like it, and so I'm interested to see where the competitors go as Yoast really diversifies and get its, uh, gets its company uh, re reorganized and people put in different places. And I see Video Superhero on YouTube says... Uh, for some reason, the images work on the su on one sublog, but not on another, and settings on both sites seem to be the same with uh, with the S3 plugin. That is weird. The I fixed one thing, and it may it may have nothing to do with that. Um, when I inspected an error yesterday on a site, um, I saw that there was a printf error in the PHP where I was calling the featured image, and I changed that to uh, an echo, and it started pulling the image. So I don't know if how the images, where the images are, if there's anything that you could do to change that around. That's just the newest one in my mind where it would not load anything. It gave me uh, lots of, of errors. Changed that one thing from a printf to an echo and it worked. So I'm not sure because that's the last one I had. Um, you know, the, the next thing that I've 
I saw in the news, uh, I really wanted to to bring up because this one is not so much it's not so much news as it is uh, newsworthy. I suppose that that the Make WordPress blog, uh, the official uh, development blog of WordPress, is on make.wordpress.org, and they post all sorts of updates throughout the year. Uh, pretty much every week, they're posting new updates about what is coming up with WordPress over the next few months, uh, what they talked about this week in meetings, that kind of stuff, and. This year, or this time, they've posted a blog called of St Our Strengths and Weaknesses, and it's really talking about the WordPress contributor uh, pool of people who are, are working on the software as a, as a general, uh, any, in any way, actually. Um, and they talk about the ways that the uh, WordPress contributors excel, and they list six things. I mean, sharing knowledge freely, that's a major strength because WordPress is, is volunteer, um, that they seek communicate uh, efficient and effective solutions, um, communicating courteously in our shared public spaces because there is an official WordPress Slack that is great. Um, it, it can get very hectic. It's very busy, but what they have really good discussions in there on various channels. Uh, they point out exceptions and possible risks when you're implementing features. Uh, they talk about raising concerns about fairness, uh, which is a huge thing right now with Gutenberg, especially with the accessibility content. Um, Gutenberg is not accessible, and that really came from people. Uh, there's a lot of accessibility audits going on for it, and the team is being restructured. And people wanted it to be accessible for everyone. That's the entire point of WordPress. And then, you know, they jumped in when help uh, to help when the need is great. So those are great things. And the, the main reason I brought this up is not because of what's going well with the contributors. And if you guys are contributors, yes, it's fantastic. Thank you for making the software because I've never been a contributor. Uh, so I thank you for putting together a piece of software that I, I, I can do this uh, for and that you guys can make your living with. Um, but they also talk about the challenges that came up. And this is the reason that I wanted to talk about this in the news section because I feel like this is going to be a place where some of you guys might see something that you can contribute, that you may see something like, oh, I'm really good at that. Maybe I could contribute a little bit. Um, because WordPress contributors, uh, this is on in general. This is on a broad scale. This is the community team, the documentation team, JavaScript team, PHP team, uh, everything is, be is being lumped together as contributors. And they're talking about that they need help with coordinating on collaborative work between teams. That that's really hard. That is one of those soft skills that gets you a new job, basically. That if you are able to, to get collaboration to happen between departments, you are one of the most talented people on earth. Uh, so that's something, if that's something that you're, you're good at, uh, you guys really uh, think about uh, getting involved aligning uh, your work, our work better to project goals and values, kind of like the accessibility that we want it to be, uh, that we want it to be accessible to everybody. And that's a core value and it's not there. So if you're good at keeping people on track, understanding team roles, leadership structures, you know, sometimes you need people to keep people in line. Um, clarifying difference between open source and open commit. Uh, that is very true um, that tracking con conversations and progress across the entire project. Maybe you are much more organized than I am and can really get to the heart. If you're the kind of person who can put together a storify on something, maybe that uh, this is a place that you can really shine and help the community move forward. Um, raising project wide concerns. They need feedback, you guys. One of the reasons that Gutenberg is even as usable as it is right now is because people let them know. They didn't use all of our suggestions. They didn't listen to us all the time. And there were times where a lot of us feel like we were ignored. But there were things that they did not change. There are things that they added in because we needed it and we wanted it. And as a community, we complained. And I think that's great. Like not changing the name from Gutenberg. They were wanting to change it into something completely different uh, at, in the middle of development and when it got pushed out, pushed out live. Um, and now, like I was talking last week, it's just kind of being referred to as the editor, the block editor. Um, 
and that's been a gradual thing that's happened as opposed to this is we're stopping it and that's something that needed to happen and the community spoke up on. Um, and then, you know, how we recognize and celebrate success because, you know, getting Gutenberg out the door, definitely success on that team's part. Def making it usable and that you can publish blogs in it every day, definitely a success. So is fixing those bugs that came out in a security release. And so is being able to have readable documentation and help on the support forums. So, you know, if you're the kind of person who is a, a glass half full uh, optimist who likes to, to give other people gold stars, they need this stuff. So I wanted to bring that up. I wanted to show you that came out. It's the new year. We're all kind of reevaluating where everything is right now. And with WordPress, if you feel like that, if any of those places are where you feel like you are uh, very, very talented or you could put a little bit of time in, WordPress needs it. I mean, it's a volunteer effort. It's a community effort. So we all do our part. Says the guy who had said he'd never committed to uh, WordPress or contributed. So um, I see that um, Uncle Social is grinding his teeth in anticipation of the next article. Um, he is the one who actually sent me an article about this, uh, the New York Times article that I found. Uh, I saw that he had tweeted about this today, and I wanted to get you guys' opinion on this, y'all's opinion, um, because... Uh, the the this is an article that is where Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the 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 founder of Facebook, has said that he wants to um, that he wants to integrate WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook Messenger. These are all three products owned by Facebook, but there have been until this point, and still are right now, uh, separate and completely different platforms. You cannot communicate between Instagram and Facebook uh, by a private message. You can't go to WhatsApp, to Instagram, nothing like that. Um, the plan is to integrate them where you can. And there are a lot of roadblocks on this, and there are a lot of uh, privacy issues, uh, given how like WhatsApp is the only one to do end-to-end -end encryption by default. The others have to be, I don't even know if you can on Instagram. On Facebook, it has to be enabled and through secret conversations, I think. I don't even know anymore about Facebook Messenger. But um, this is something that he brought up, uh, Uncle Social brought up about, about Facebook. And when I saw it, and we all know from uh, previous streams that he's not a big fan of Facebook, but this is something that may affect you a lot more than, uh, than most things with Facebook. I mean, depending on where you are in the world, WhatsApp might be your primary form of communication. I know that uh, in South America, and it mentioned South America in this one, I know a lot of my South American and Central American students use WhatsApp almost exclusively to text. Um, they talk about WeChat in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's just, there are these kinds of apps that take over, and WhatsApp specifically, uh, because of this, they don't want people, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. If you use that, you need to, uh, there, there needs to be some sort of place for you to go because you're using that for a reason and you're not using the others for a reason. Um, and if that's privacy, you should be concerned about this. Um, not because of, of Facebook is evil or anything like that, but because of the way that the, uh, the interaction on the back end may go because they, uh, this article brings up the point that you don't sign in or sign up to them for them in the same way. You use a phone number for WhatsApp, but you use your personal real information for Messenger, uh, and you can do it anonymously, really, uh, on Instagram. So there are there are trade-offs on this. Um, it's it's going to be an interesting transition, I think, on this one. Um, because of, of privacy concerns primarily and uh, because of how the world in different places use these apps. Um, it's not just something that people do for fun. It's a primary means of communication. I know that WhatsApp lets you travel. I know a lot of us, when we were on our company retreat, were using WhatsApp because sometimes text messages didn't work when we were traveling out of country. I know a lot of my friends do that when they travel to Panama from the United States. They have to use WhatsApp because they can't call or uh, text otherwise on their with their normal plans that these 
these apps let us do things, and with being consolidated with others, we need to uh, be aware that we might lose some of that freedom. And I say freedom in the uh, in the not uh, governmental way, but the freedoms that we're used to with it and may need to search for an alternative. So if that's the case, uh, that you use one of these all the time and you don't like the idea of it uh, putting in there, um, think about it. Uh, think about what you're doing, how you do it, why you use it. Um, Signal is a great option to talk to people. Um, I think Uncle Social has mentioned Telegram on here before. Uh, there are um, a lot of different end-to-end uh, -end encryption apps that you can use uh, for messaging if you can get people on them. That's the real problem with this. But I wanted you guys to know about this. Uncle Social wanted everybody to know about this, and I stole it from him. So this is a uh, kind of a big deal that they're wanting to consolidate these three platforms. Um, I see uh, Jack on uh, Facebook says, uh, uh, I just think it's funny it's on Facebook. That's the only reason I'm laughing. Uh, says that combining the messaging platforms will be great if it allows for chatbots to work on all of them. And I think that, Jack, is one of the reasons that they're talking about this is to be able to have a consistent messaging platform that lets marketers target people on all of them. In the end, I think that's what it's going to be, where you can set up chatbots, you can set up marketing campaigns, and if you put a, a live chat on your website uh, and just have it being like right now, it's just Facebook Messenger that you can add on there or WhatsApp, um, you can do that and then have the AI on there to respond back uh, however you need across those. It's, uh, I would assume, because they... Apparently, Zuckerberg is being really uh, wishy-washy on and ambiguous on why he wants to do this. Like the people are saying the sources say he's being kind of ambiguous on there, which makes the cynic in me and what you're saying here with the chatbots, that just makes sense. I mean, it's not conspiracy theory kind of thing like that. It's like if I were in that position, what would let me target the most users for the uh, least amount of effort? Uh, once you get that initial effort of combining those platforms messaging backends, you have access to 2.5 billion more users than you do using just Messenger. Um, and of course, there's overlap in that because some people have Facebook Messenger, Instagram, and uh WhatsApp, but even if you add a third of two and a half billion to it, it's like you're getting a lot of people to market to. And I, I would assume that chatbots and uh, marketing things like that are are definitely part of the decision, uh, the decision making process for this. Um, I see that uh, Uncle Social on YouTube says that there have already been messenger data breaches with developers getting full access to chat histories, and it's not worth the risk. I'm I agree. One thing that I like about uh, WhatsApp is that I and I didn't know about it until today. Don't get me wrong, because I don't I don't use it, and I don't know anyone who does outside of you know travel. Is that it doesn't keep a message history that the message histories are kept locally, uh, not anywhere in the cloud. And so Facebook Messenger keeps everything in the cloud. Um, it's uh, that is concerning that you get full chat histories. Um, it's concerning because I use those chat histories like email archives. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was meeting uh, with someone, uh, when was it? I don't remember when. And to get the password that I had assigned them, they uh, went back into the Facebook Messenger history where I'd sent it to them. That is not secure, but that's how I did it. That's how he did it. That's how we were communicating that's the kind of thing that we need to be worried about when these kind of data breaches occur that give us access to that. Um, and uh, Monique, or, or Uncle So says, imagine the uh, damage if your chats with a girlfriend and boyfriend were released online or conversation with friends in which you're saying bad things about your boss and employer. Um, the uh, That is... That's gotten people fired already because they thought things were private or they posted them on Twitter and didn't know how Twitter ads worked. And, I mean, it's... Yeah, bad stuff will happen. And um, Donald, Donal, I'm sorry, sorry, Don. Um, the uh, soon it'll be chatbots talking to other chatbots and then telling us what they've decided. Um, you need to go look up a stand-up routine uh, by John Mulaney about uh, the recaptchas and robots. It's just hilarious. It's the like uh, the the base of the joke is that we are. Uh, people trying to get to our stuff 
uh, but we have set up robots to tell us whether we're robots or not. And so we have to verify to a robot that we're robots because that we're not robots because the robot thinks we're a robot. And it's, it's hilarious. I just love it. But you're right. Chatbots are becoming uh, nuts right now. And, um, I think that, uh, I read, I read it last week. I think that, uh, within the next five years, there are going to be, uh, voice, like, like audio chatbots, like for the robocalls that are going to be sophisticated enough to put together a conversation, uh, with the AI and the, uh, the, the, the linguistic and phonetic finesse that you won't be able to tell you're not talking to a human being. Um, that's when it scares me. Like that is that kind of singularity moment where I'm like, uh, and if you don't know what the singularity is, you should look it up because it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, they, um, that's that, uh, that was the news. Uh, thanks for uncle show social to bringing that up, uh, because it was, it had completely, um, it was completely, uh, not on, in my radar when I saw that it was like crazy. Uh, Video Superhero uh, says he was at Google I.O. I'm, I'm assuming he. I'm sorry if you're a she. I, I really don't know that video. Uh, they were at Google I.O. and uh, had a scary demo at the keynote. I didn't see that keynote. Uh, please explain. I want to know about this so that I can go look it up and uh, be interested in this and terrified like you. Um, the uh, uh, So, yeah, that's uh, that's super Super scary. I, I I agree. Like just AI in general, kind of scary. Um, and yeah, coming soon, the weekly WWE roundup with uh, you know deep fake BJ Keaton. Uh, just think about Robo Me doing this uh, this stream. You can't tell a difference. There's no robot that can emulate me, y'all. Uh, I'm too I'm too spastic. Uh, apparently, uh, Video Superhero says Google uh, made an AI assistant uh, to make a phone reservation at a Thai restaurant. Oh my goodness. That scares me, just the thought of it, that it was able to do that. I've got to look that up. Thank you for letting me know about that. I'm just opening up a new tab right now. Uh, oh, Thai restaurant. Um, also, mmm, Thai food. Um, mm. <laughs> so, uh, on that note, uh, if you're just joining in, uh, we're move we just moved through the news section. Uh, you can always go back and listen to it, uh, get into part of the discussion. Uh, when this stream ends, they will be archived on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Um, now we're moving into the tutorial section, where uh, generally it's anything that I find that I think may be a help to you guys. Um, whether it is whether it's something that, that you can do on your WordPress website, better for your freelance business, better for your design business, better for your, your agency, whatever it is, if I find it and think that you can use it, I'll put it in here. And uh, because we get header and footer questions so often, um, and people are wondering when the uh, header and footer creator are coming, to which I will answer sometime. Uh, we're working on it. That's all I know. Uh, still, no idea. Um, Divi Space posted up a an article titled "The Easiest Way to Create a Footer in Divi," and so I wanted to toss it up, uh, let you guys know that uh, how to use the uh, portability options in Divi and really put together footer and footer widgets. Uh, good stuff the way that uh, they've put it together here. Um, Divi, Divi Space always puts out good, uh, good stuff. Divi Cake, Divi Life, all of these are, are wonderful, wonderful websites with tutorials. Um, and depending on, uh, depending on the, uh, the week, whatever's put out, I try to link to as many, uh, you know, Divi, uh, Divi, uh, designer and tutorial sites as we can. So if you have any, if you run one, send me an email, uh, let me know where you are so I can add it to my reader. I'm always looking for stuff like that. Um, so yeah, um, the next one that I saw, uh, was on our blog. Donetta did this. Uh, I don't understand. I've said this before. I don't understand how a human being thinks about how to do these things in Divi. And, uh, it's just amazing to me. One that we were talking about in Slack. I think you guys are going to love that we're talking about that should be coming up soon. Um, but this one is called how to apply colliding animations to design Divi elements or design elements with Divi. And it, uh, 
it's pretty that that you can take a grid to make it animate on hover out uh, if you go out it's colliding text that you can use the animations to show overlap with box shadow it's it is I love seeing things like this because my brain doesn't work this way. Donetta put stuff together that's just beautiful. Uh, click through that link so that you can learn how to do it too. Um, very, very good stuff. I see the... Uh... Oh, I see Uncle Social said that the Google Assistant demo was scripted. Nowhere near ready though. Uh, I think that the fact that it's still there is terrifying. And uh, that that uh, the uh, I did I did bring up the header and footer. I'm sorry, but I was trying to help you guys. Um, so the let me see here. The third one was one that Torque Mag did. That uh, Torque always puts up really good stuff. And how to monitor user activity in WordPress. We need to know. These, these days, you guys, we need to know exactly what our users are doing so that we don't lose them. If we have a if we have a person on our website, we need to know what we can do to keep them there, to engage them so that they don't leave. And, um, you know, we need to know who's logging in. We need to know why and how. And you can, uh, they have a... Uh, plugin that they they talk about called uh, simple history that shows what people are doing uh, this is also what people on your staff are doing as well if you need to check and just see if you want an event log it's great for that I've used this just to to see I've used it in some tutorial or something that I was doing and uh, just to see what it was and it's cool just seeing everything that you do that it's recording in the logs so it's a very, very, very useful thing for somebody out there, I thought. Um, I see that Savage uh, Mycin is on, so yo. Um, then the next thing that Torque Mag published is something I am terrible at, okay? TDD. If you know what TDD is, Test Driven Development, it is, uh, as they put it, um, in the very first sentence of this article, is a philosophy of software development that's based on writing tests before writing the feature or bug fix. So um, it changes the way that you think about development, they say, and it's true. Um, and it's very hard that th this author, uh, Josh Pollock, who uh, of Caldera, not, yeah, Caldera Forms, um, has written this because it's hard to move to test driven development. Um, and it's, it's because you have to think about what you want the app or product or feature to do before you've even written the feature because you're saying that I want it to be able to, to log in uh, and, and you need to have the, the algorithmic outline down. You need it to be able to log in. You need to be able to, to change your username and then log out and you write tests to show to how to perform those tasks, then you write the software to pass those tests. And it's really hard. It's really hard for me to do. It's hard to move into, uh, as he says, and it's way easier to get into if you don't have software that exists already. If you're going in with uh, a new project, you write the test, you do this, you get into it and you learn as you go. But as he's talking about in this, he uh, talks about doing it for existing software where you're adding tests that you are testing old features as well as new features. So you need to be able to make sure that everything within your code base passes the test and does what you want it to do. Very hard to do, but this is an incredibly interesting read uh, if you're interested even a little in software development and the process behind the scenes um, that, that where you dig into the code and the logic. It, it's, it's so good. Thank you, Josh, for putting this together. Um, and it, 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 it's got code snippets to show how to do the tests. It's showing how to do this with existing plugins is what, what he's doing. It is just wonderful stuff. Uh, so please check that out. Uh, and if you're not using uh, test-driven development and you are a plugin author, if you're a developer, look into it because while it takes a long, a lot to get into, it takes a lot of effort to learn how to do. 
once you're in it, it saves you a lot of time debugging and, and actually having to manually run the tests because you don't get green lights on it. You, you, you run this feature, it doesn't pass the test, you move on. You don't often have to compile an entire program uh, if you're still writing in something that has to be compiled. Um, and you, you can make sure right then and there that this one specific thing is failing and then move forward and fix that instead of trying to uh, pull on the string and see if this fixes it uh, at, like a lot of PHP tends to be. Um, I see in the, the YouTube com or yeah YouTube comments that uh, Isom is asking if anyone's had experience with one and one uh, and Ionos. Um, Uncle Social uses them as a domain registrar. Um, I have used one and one. I had very little trouble with them until I wanted to cancel um, the. I had set my domains not to renew and they did anyway and it was the way the system is set up i had to actually contact them to get a refund on the domains that i wasn't going to renew that i'd set not to renew and remove my payment information from um uh, it could have been a fluke it could have been something because it's a one-off anecdotal thing uh, up until then over the course of the year they were in contact they have really good support uh they they did uh, everything I needed them to do, it was cheap and easy. Everything was great until that one thing at the very end. So um, I'm in the, I'm in the, they're okay boat. Uh, definitely not uh, something where I would say avoid them at all costs by any means. Uh, if you use them or want to use them to diversify and keep your domains at different places, I don't see any problem. Just make sure that how you've got your billing and everything set up for the renewals and auto renewals and manual renewals, all of that is completely set. Uh, and you know exactly what it is because it was not uh, my, it was set not to renew and said and showed that it wasn't renewed, but I still got charged. So that's the kind of thing that you ought to be aware of. That's the case with anything, though. It just happened to me that that one happened with that particular registrar. I'm sure people have had that happen to them at uh, at GoDaddy and and Bluehost and Namecheap and and everywhere as well. And I haven't because that's my luck. I got hit here. So take that for what you want from me. Um, I see video uh, superheroes says that with the S3 issue that we discussed at the beginning where they weren't showing up. Uh, images weren't showing up. Everything updated prior to September 11th, 2014 shows a thumbnail. Everything after doesn't. Um, hmm. It may sound like a really silly suggestion right now, but have you gone through and tried regenerating all the thumbnails on the images? Um, through one of the image optimizers that you could go through and just regenerate everything, that might work, maybe, if that's the case. Um, I don't know. And Isom says uh, that uh, invoice, uh, that, that, that with one and one that they do invoice-based, not web-based uh, billing, and that would explain the discrepancy for me then. Thank you. Uh, so, hey, user error, like, you know, 90% of this stuff is. So, uh, like I said, everything up to that point was uh, really, was exactly like I needed it to be with one and one. So, so take that. Don't, they're good. They're fine. Uh, I haven't, I haven't used them as my primary though. So I know other people have. Um, so that was TDD one and one and, uh, cats who code has a, has, has a, a fun one for designers. Um, making the core principles or applying the core principles of iterative design uh, to make users love you. And I love, I love iterative design. I love anything that is being iterated on uh, because they, uh, you can see the changes that come. Um, I don't like, you know, clean slate redos of video games, of software, of anything. If you give me an all new piece of something I love, I'm like, why, why would you do this to me? Where I want it to be iterative and I see it. And that's what they're talking about, uh, where you get user analysis and uh, see what people are doing, what they're, they're doing uh, that works and what they're doing and failing at where that friction is. 
um, that there's design that you can see uh, where they're having problems with clutter, um, opt how you can optimize the system for various browsers where you can iterate and see, okay, this is doing better in Chrome, this makes it do better in Firefox, all of that, um, where you can try A-B test, various subscription models, things like that. Uh, just the, the case studies that they're talking about of going through this, uh, they go through using rapid iterative prototyping and designing uh, the homepage for Nielsen Norman Group. Uh, uh, the first stage was reanalyzing the audience. Uh, they used multi-stage usability testing, a uh, number of qualitative surveys, and then the second phase was homepage redesign using some of those mock-ups uh, based on that testing and then just you know doing it over and over and over and over again until they got it right. Um, if you do that and you do it right, you will absolutely uh, get a, uh, a good product out of it that your users will really appreciate. Look at the iPhone. The iPhone is, is iterative design at its best. Nothing has changed uh, with the fundamental way we interact with an iPhone from the first version of it. It's still, if you take an iPhone 1 out right now versus an XS Max, and you look at them and you use them, you will interact with them in the same ways. But every year, the iteration of that has gotten better to the point where if they came out and redesigned it and it was a an all new UI, all new interface, all new design, colors, uh, locations, uh, swipe gestures, everything, we would hate them for doing that. Uh, so it's, it's something that... Uh, that that works well when done well. Um, I see Uncle Social says if Dig had used iterative design, then we wouldn't have read it. That is true. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, Dig's revolution rather than evolution uh, killed their site. I remember when that happened that I was never a Dig user, but I remember finding content shared through there constantly uh, there and stumble upon. Uh, I was more of a stumble upon user. And you're absolutely right. They just all of a sudden one day was like, wham! And it's like, nah, we don't like this. And uh, like you said, Reddit is now Reddit. Um, unfortunately, um, that uh, I can't remember the, uh, the founder's name who uh, ended up dying by suicide. But uh, he, uh, um, that's one really terrible thing that came because Reddit was successful. But that's, you know, that completely tangential to to that but yes the uh if dig had done that and they slowly moved into a new new arena would have been a lot better um so uh i see that that uncle social also says don't forget cloudflare is now a domain registrar uh they promised to sell domains at their cost with no margins i didn't know that good to know uh, I actually don't know a whole lot about cloudflare personally i've never used many of their services uh at all just uh, just scratching the surface really so i'll look into that so the one of the very last tutorials on here is uh well two last uh on the tutorial list is how to add a live facebook feed to your wordpress site and this is uh this is um aspen grove studios adding a live facebook feed to your site it's hard to do when I was doing an article last year on how to add live video to your site, it's way more complicated to add just a live video player from Facebook than it should be. Um, and so they walk you through the process of getting uh, the live video in there to show on there with a uh, um, play button, all of that stuff. Um, and it's... Uh, it is through a custom Facebook feed plugin, uh, and you still can go through uh, the Divi uh, Divi Builder and use uh, different embed codes uh, and put in uh, divs for the uh, Facebook widget. I guess I don't know what it's called. Um, and then under tutorials, the very last one, eliminating Slack. As a to the eliminating Slack as a distraction to work better, 
And uh, Joe, again, Casabona, I, I know I'm going to butcher his name. He writes a lot uh, and writes really good stuff. But this one, I use Slack for work. A lot of you guys use Slack for work. I also use Slack for uh, keeping up with my podcast community and uh, for fun. I'm a member of multiple Slacks. I'm, I use Slack to keep up with a local development group here. I talked last week about different Slacks for web designers and web developers and all of this for local stuff. But Slack, as Joe puts it, creates the pressure of immediacy. When you get a Slack message, whether it is from your supervisor, from your coworker, a subordinate, or just a friend, it makes you think that you have to, that you have to respond immediately. Um, email has gotten us away from that a lot of times. Uh, texting has really put us back on it, and Slack has made it the uh, has made it really uh, that, that that we want to be responded to immediately. Uh, and it's the way he puts it is that Slack is the virtual knock on the door and hey, you have a minute. Uh, that that's like because you'll really get that kind of message. It's hard to work well when you're constantly getting pinged like that. Uh, if you don't have pings like that all the time, you don't have to worry about this. But if you do, he has a really good suggestion: turn off all notifications. And uh, check it when you do it and check it like you do email. And yes, I know Slack is a response to email to be able to communicate better. And it's still a better communication tool because of channels and chat and private messages. All this file sharing is, is way better than email still. But uh, you can log, he says, log out of most Slack teams. The ones that you don't need, get rid of. Um, Four, he says there's maybe four he feels he should be logged into. For me, right now, I looked at my Slack, and across all of my devices, I'm logged into three consistently. Some devices have others, uh, but three I'm logged into everywhere. And turn off notifications on mobile, uh, turn off desktop notifications, and then turn off badge indicators uh, where you won't see that you have messages waiting for you. It's, it's interesting to me to think, because I like the badge notifications because that lets me know if something is urgent. And here's the thing. He says that those urgent things that I'm waiting for in Slack, that I'm like, oh, I've got a two. Let me see what's going on. It's not urgent, y'all. The way he says it, most emergencies aren't actually emergencies. Uh, this is something I always said uh, when I was teaching, when I, I was teaching English. Uh, I'm not doing any work where people's lives depend on it. Um, I always told people that the reason I was an English teacher is that no one would die if I misinterpreted Beowulf. And that holds really true for most of the emergencies that will come up in most of our jobs. Um, there are going to be emergencies. Don't get me wrong. You know, He says most emergencies aren't emergencies. But if somebody needs you right that second, there are ways to get in touch with you. And most of the things that we get hit with on Slack every day, on Twitter, on Facebook Messenger, whatever you use to communicate with, with your team, with your clients, anything, they're not emergency emergencies. They're not something that is so urgent and important that you have to respond to it literally immediately. And that's one of the things he talks about, that, that you can do this in a structured way, in a mindful way, to be able to... Uh, to get people uh, to not think you're available 24-7. One of the suggestions that he uses is changing his Slack status to, if you need me, email is better, and then his email. Or you could say, if you really need me, uh, my cell phone is, and you put your cell phone there if you're really, you know, you really want to be only, you know, reached in an emergency like that. Um, what, it's, what he said it did is change to, well, the way he says it is, again, it also helps me manage expectations because it's now don't rely on Slack as the best way to get a hold of me. And that, I think, is really important um, because you think about it. Um, I don't remember if it was this article, actually. I'm looking through it, and I actually don't see it. But uh, work is uh, email. Like, I used to use email all the time. And one of the things that I did was I stopped checking my email at work. I may have mentioned this to y'all, to you regular viewers before, that 
there was a time where I started getting so panicky and anxious about getting a student email or, or an administrator email at night that I would have to respond immediately to it, that I was giving myself panic attacks. So I stopped. I would not check my email once I left campus, that when I set out uh, to work the next day, if something came through, I would glance at it. I had a 90 minute drive, so I had plenty of time to uh, glance at my email, whether I should have or not. Um, I could do that and then call and respond to somebody, or I would check it in my office the next day, but I would not do it once I left campus in the evening. And people, the one, one of him says, uh, he says in this or somebody else, I really, really can't remember which it was, said that you guys, uh, all of us really overemphasize how urgent and necessary everyone needs us to be, that how, how connected we have to be all the time. And it was super interesting to think about for this one because they were like, well, I'm, you know, don't ask if you can turn off email notifications from your work. Don't ask if you turn them off and nothing changes, you don't need your email notifications and you don't need that stress in your life. That if you, if your job and your interaction and everyone is exactly the same or barely changes at all, you're fine. If something comes up, we're like, why, you know, why can we not get a hold of you? Why can, you know, why are you not responding to this? That's when you can have that discussion. Like, oh, I did this, or do I not need to do this? When do we need to do it to work it out? Um, it was, uh, it was a very, very useful thing for me. I didn't tell anybody. That's one of the reasons I say this is I didn't tell anyone other than the people I worked with directly that, uh, my assistant director, um, my, uh, my, my tutor coordinator, and then the, the people who I worked with uh, on a daily basis, my tutors, I let them know that once I walked out that door, email was not the way to get me, and they had ways to get in touch with me if they needed me to call me. Um, I did not tell anyone else on campus that. And lo and behold, they didn't need me. Nine times out of ten, probably more than that, they didn't need me. And so I think it, uh, it was great thing to do that. I wanted this article. I wanted to bring this up because it's, it's really, really important that you make sure, especially this time of year when you're reevaluating everything. I mean, I know everybody is, it's a cliche, but we're all doing it while you're reevaluating how you want to work, uh, how you want your clients to get a hold of you, how you want to interact with people and what you can declutter out of your life. If you've uh, watched the Marie Kondo uh, Netflix show or read the book recently because of the Netflix show, you're, you're probably in that same decluttering mindset that a lot of us are. Uh, you, you, Think about how people get in touch with you because there's a lot of clutter there. There's a lot of, of pollution uh, in our communication streams. Um, I see uh, that the urgency scale that Uncle Social uses on here is uh, urgent to meh, that a phone call is immediate, chat is when you get around to it, emails within 24 hours, <laughs> and a letter in the post is at your leisure, and if you fax him, you're never getting a response. Um uh, JL Web Creative said, I remember 25 years ago, a software dev client wanted them, uh, wanted me to fax them the entire config.sys file for the Sega Mega Drive. Oh my goodness. Um, it's, uh, that is insane. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the boss faxed them back. Are you, uh, are, are you bleeding, uh, brain dead? Um, Charles says it's very important to maintain, uh, to train your clients around how to get hold of you. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Uncle Social says give your clients a, bit, a treat or a biscuit when they contact you in the right way. Absolutely. Um, that is the best thing that you can do is uh, let people know the best way to contact you by positive reinforcement. Don't yell at somebody for for using a, a, a way that you don't want to be contacted because I one time used to give my cell phone to students and I know there's some people that as I said that were like oh what is wrong with you but I did it I wanted to be accessible to them I was also 25 years old and brand new at teaching 
and I learned not to do that very quickly. But as I transitioned out of that and trained the people that I wanted them to use email to contact me the next next uh, year of students and so on, the ones that I had given my cell phone to, I had to be like, hey, uh, busy right now, email me this, that kind of thing. Where I didn't yell at them, like, why are you texting me? I told you not to. It's, hey, sure, this is what you need to do. And then I'll like, email me the rest of it and we'll talk that way. Where you need to be nice about it. You need not to uh, burn any bridges or, or, you know, do anything like that. But if you're looking for how to do all of it, then you uh, how, to, how to really prioritize your communication, turning off notifications is a really, really good way to do it. Um, I know it helped me. So we, my friends, are out of time, and I, for the first time in, man, well over a year, did not even get to the resources section. So here is what I'm giving you for homework. Like I said, I used to be an English teacher, so here's what Professor Beege is giving to you right now. I want you to read the resources section. Uh, there are some really good things in there for you to get through this week uh, and this weekend. Uh, the top ones that I really, really liked were the top three, honestly. Um, Yoast posted up what is a Google search console. If you don't use Google Search Console and you're setting up websites and you're working on SEO, uh, all this, you need to make yourself infinitely, intimately familiar with it. And I suppose infinitely familiar too. Like we all need to really, you know, dive in. So as, as much as we possibly can. Um, and if you do use it, maybe it'll show you a couple of things or make you think of ways that you haven't used it uh, before. Um, then there's another New York Times article that I ran across. I was reading this, this, this morning while I was uh, having my coffee, uh, which was perfect given the uh, one we talked about earlier about Facebook merging its messaging platforms. Um, it's called He Reported on Facebook. Now he approaches it with caution, uh, where this guy uh, was a, a, an investigative journalist, tech journalist as well, who uh, doesn't even have Facebook installed on his phone. And it's just a really good read. Um, it's not even anti-Facebook. It's just a, a, a state of privacy and geolocation, really, more than anything. It's super cool. Uh, I really, really liked it, and I think that you guys would like that one as well. Um, and then the third one on here and the final one that I'll mention before having to, uh, to sign off today is a list of 5,000 websites that accept guest posts in 2019, 5,000. And I, I approached this with, with caution. I was like, are you, you are not serious. You did not just list out 5,000 websites. And then as you scroll to the bottom, they are categorized in there. They did not put a bulleted list of, of these sites, but it does have a very large list at the bottom separated out of like uh, self-improvement blogs, um, 80, 873 web development blogs uh, that you can click. And it talks about the number of published articles, how, when the last published article was, the domain authority, the domain spam score, and a link to their submission URL. This is awesome. This is a tool that I have wanted for the last 10 years, y'all. Um, I've there are sites like this for uh, there are sites like this for for, for uh, short story submissions. There are uh, sites like this for my fiction that I use, like Duotrope. But I've never seen one that is this in depth for. Uh, for guest posting on blogs and getting your content out there in your name, especially one that talks about the domain authority, their publishing schedule and uh, their domain spam score, all of this, like it's great. So if you need to get your content out there, y'all, here's 5,000 ways that you can do it. Um, so with that, I suppose that's a good stopping point. The rest of the resources are obviously really awesome or I wouldn't have put them on there for you. Uh, there's there, there are some great ones. Uh, especially the medium versus WordPress comparing apples and oranges. Uh, which one's better? Which one's better for what y'all? Uh, but that's it for me today, you guys. Thank you for joining in uh, and watching the weekly WP Roundup. I always love being able to sit down and do this. I love seeing you guys here in the conversations that we get to have. 
Um, I see that uh, that the conversation is still going. Um, I want to tell you all how much I appreciate you for taking time out of your day uh, and watching this. Um, we do offer other live streams that if you enjoyed this, I think you'll really love our other live streams. Uh, every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern, uh, Mac goes through a Divi feature and uh, walks people through the uh, feature updates. Uh, and every Tuesday, we have a use case using our layout packs that can show you how to use Divi in a real world setting. So Donetta and Jason go through there with our use cases. They are great things. You know uh, how great and talented they both are. So um, it is they're great streams. So that one is at 3 p.m. Eastern on Tuesdays, the same time this one is on Fridays, and uh, Max is at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uh, you can find them on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, you can see any of the previous ones. They are archived on those channels as well. And if you want to be notified of any future live streams, click the notification bell on YouTube. Maybe it's somewhere like right here-ish. Uh, watch me get that completely wrong. And uh, you can let Facebook know under the following section that you want to receive notifications whenever our page goes live. Uh, and we will let you know. We, uh, we want to see you in the comments next week. I hope to see you next week, um, or at least your name, avatar, and uh, wonderful things that you have to say. Um, I will uh, be back then. So thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for being Elegant Themes uh, fans, subscribers, and uh, you know, if you're not, you can go to elegantthemes.com slash Divi and check out Divi. Uh, it's awesome. But uh, I will see you guys next Friday. Um, and, uh, and I see Payush before I go, uh, Payush, uh, again, butcher that one, uh, want to have header functionality. Uh, that one is being worked on. I don't have a date on it. Don't have an ETA, but I promise you that, uh, that it will be coming. Uh, I'm not going to say, <laughs> I think the way that I saw, uh, things like that put, uh, recently was not today, not tomorrow, not this year, not next month but soon. So uh, it will uh, it will be uh, soon, uh, but we don't know what that is yet. So, uh, But we are working on it. So thank you for being patient on that. And like I said, thanks for, uh, for tuning in, everybody. I hope to see you next Friday. Uh, take it easy, y'all.